All right, hi everyone. We are back. And we are going to kick it off with Jordan Bond. Um, really excited to have Jordan here with us today. Jordan is going to be talking to us about energy efficiency and the P2P web. P2P, of course, standing for your two peer. Um, so Jordan is a front end developer, UX designer, and product manager. Um, and she's done everything and in between for the last 20 years. Um, her current role is a co-founder and product lead for an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer data diary app called Tally Lab. Um, so, Jordan, I'm going to pass presenter over to you. And, uh, you can okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Hey. I should warn you all that I have a very squeaky chair, so... You might hear some squeaking, <laughs> and I apologize. <laughs> um, so how do I share my screen? I have already forgotten. Ah, I found it. Okay. Okay. You all see this? Yes? Yeah, we see it. Okay, and it's full screen? Um, yes, yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So far, so good. Okay. So... Yes, my name is Jordan Bonds, and I will be talking today about energy efficiency in the peer-to-peer -peer web. Specifically, I am exploring the question of whether a peer-to-peer -peer architecture is more or less energy efficient than the web's current favorite architectural model client server. And if none of those words make any sense to you, if you have no idea what an architectural model is, it's cool. We're going to figure this all out together over the course of this talk. I should say, uh, you seen a lot of numbers today and you're going to see more numbers in this talk, but I want to kind of give the disclaimer that I'm treating this kind of like a Fermi problem or like a back of the envelope calculation kind of situation. So you're going to see a lot of numbers and they're the best numbers I could get. But really, this is like a comparison of different systems. So it's like the differences between them are what's going to end up being important. So try not to dwell too much on the numbers. Okay, so who am I? I am currently the co-founder of Tally Lab. And Tally Lab is a data diary app that is peer-to-peer -peer in part right now, and we are incrementally moving toward being fully peer-to-peer, -peer, which is why it occurred to me to ask the question of whether it's actually more energy efficient or not. And I wanted to show you all this list of titles uh, just to give you a sense of my technical background. I come at user experience and product management with a development perspective. And long before I had ever built my first website, way back in the 1990s, I, like possibly some of you, was just a teenager with a modem dorking around on the internet. And this is my attempt at a recreation of a conversation I probably had at some point with my boyfriend at the time, Dan, over a one-to-one -one chat program called Telnet, <laughs> where you would literally watch someone else type like before your very eyes, like letter by letter. It was bananas. Okay. So your computer used its modem to call another computer over the phone. And this is basically like a non-distributed peer-to-peer model. And we're starting here because it is a very straightforward architecture, as you can plainly see. One device directly connecting to another device. And that's going to make it a lot easier for us to figure out how much electricity uh, we used doing this. But as we'll see, that's actually easier said than done. So, how much electricity did this conversation between me and Dan consume? Well, <laughs> let's assume for the purposes of this exercise that Dan and I were each running the hottest desktop computer of 1995, the Compaq Presario 2200, and we each had, heaven help us, 15-inch CRT monitors. It was the Stone Age, people. Uh, and we had them on at full brightness because those are the numbers I could find. So, you mark these in your mind. And we're both connecting to the internet via 33.6K modems. Not the best of the time, not the worst. And to be honest, I feel like I was maybe using like an 8K modem, which is 8K, that's like terrifying to consider. But I'm trying to be conservative here with regard to energy, so we're gonna go with the Primo 33.6. Still not that energy intensive though compared to our other components, uh, as you can see here. And this was all over the phone line, of course. And I had to actually use DSL numbers here because it turns out that people in the 90s 
didn't really care how much electricity it took to make a phone call <laughs> and did not record that information anywhere for posterity on the internet that I could find. Obviously, feel free to uh, fill me in if you know those statistics. You can find out what the voltage is that goes across the landline, but the phone call itself remains shrouded in mystery. Okay, so let's assume that Dan and I talked for one hour because easy math. And also, if there's one constant in this universe, it's that teenagers are going to chat for as long as you'll let them, right? So this is our entire system. <laughs> Seems maybe complex, but it'll get way more complex after this. So what's this all add up to? A grand total of 236.2 watt hours. Perhaps you do not have a good intuitive sense of how much electricity a watt hour is. That's fair. It is about four 60 watt incandescent bulbs, all burning for an hour. State of the art tech in 1995. Uh, and if we've all been doing our job for the last 24 years, that touch point shouldn't be very intuitive for you either. I'm hoping none of you are burning any incandescent bulbs in your house. So I've translated this all into mobile phones for you, which is, this is like you charging and draining your mobile phone for 40 days, more or less, give or take, depending on your phone and how you use it. So that's cool. There's a lot going on <laughs> on this screen right now. But what if we paired off every person on the internet in 1995 for a special hour-long telnet chat with another person on the internet? How much electricity would that take? Here is our 236.2 watt hour telnet call times 4.4 million people, which is, according to Cisco, how many people were, quote, on the internet at the time. And I'm really not sure how they define that, but we're going to roll with it. Uh, that comes to 519.64 megawatt hours. So we're going from watt hours, blowing right past kilowatt hour, and we're going to megawatt hour. And one megawatt hour is roughly equivalent to the electricity used by 330 homes in an hour. So 519.64 of them is like we added 171,481 entire homes with all of their light bulbs and TVs and refrigerators and who knows what else to the grid for an hour, which is actually extremely messed up <laughs> if you think about that. Just having a text chat required all of that electricity. That is wild. And, you know, we could have just called each other on the landline, although hard to model since we don't know how much electricity that used. Um, so this is a rough sketch of a non-distributed peer-to-peer architectural model and the energy it requires, or at least the energy it required in 1995. But we actually had graphical websites and the browsers with which to view them in 1995. If some of you were alive then, you might recall. <laughs> Behold the glory of Netscape.com in 1995. A lot of gray on gray happening here. What if I wanted to use my dial-up modem to access this website? Better question, what if all 4.4 million of us wanted to do that at the same time? You can't really do that with a one-to-one -one connection over a phone. You'd have to like get in some kind of weird hold line like imagine typing Netscape.com into your browser and you get a message that's like, you're 50th in line to see this like beautiful gray on gray <laughs> website. I don't think that that would have gone over very well, especially then given how long it would have taken to like download that graphic we're looking at here over your, mo over your 8K modem. So clearly we need an architectural model that can accommodate many, many machines accessing the same content at the same time. Yes. It's the client-server model. Here it is. Behold. You, the browser of the web, are the client, and the place where the web lives is the server, which has specialized hardware and software to make handling thousands of concurrent connections possible. And this, folks, is still the architectural model of choice for roughly 90% of today's internet. You are looking at it in vastly simplified form. Because, of course, today, you're likely connecting to the internet via fiber optic cable instead of DSL. And actually, even more likely, you're on a mobile device which is either connected to Wi-Fi or it's con continuously pinging cell phone towers. And if we're going to be really honest, this got, gets very complicated very quickly. There's, we have to account for like interchanges and content delivery way stations and external databases and all manner of devices involved 
you looking at a website on the internet. It can get pretty crazy. So let's make this a little easier for ourselves. We are going to download a song. That's it. How much electricity does the client server model use when you download a song from the internet? And we're actually going to specifically download What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, a classic tune with enduring themes. I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, and I am going to use something <laughs> for this model that I like to call emoji algebra, because our only alternative is to do the actual math for this, which involves extremely small numbers that are best expressed in scientific notation. And I promise none of you want to see that. I didn't want to see it, but I took a hit for the team and translated all of this into graphical symbols, because that's all any of our crazy internet adult brains in 2019 can handle. So uh, our main characters in this fashion play are the server, our laptop, <laughs> and a router. This is the router. This is representing the, the pathway that the MP3 is going to take from the server to our laptop. Seems pretty simple, right? OK, let's, uh, let's calculate some electricity here. By far, the most energy used in our system is by the server. And that's just to turn it on. Like, having it on uses almost 80 times more energy than the router. But in addition to just having the server on, we also need to like find the MP3, maybe do a little processing to it, send it off in the right direction. So perhaps you noticed, and perhaps it didn't even register, a tiny little sliver that I added to the top of that column there for processing. So we've got our baseline server. We've got a little bit of processing on top. These are as proportional as Google Sheets would let me make them. I tried. Um, OK, so we actually have a far bigger problem with our server, which is that it gets very hot while it's working. So we have to use even more electricity to keep it cool. And it actually takes one watt of cooling for every watt of processing we do. That is double the energy just for cooling. And honestly, it could be as high as triple. I saw some, some hardware combinations that suggested it would be triple. Terrifying. But we're being conservative here, so we're going to stick with double. OK, that's our server. Next up, the router. That's it. Adds just a little bit of electricity, as advertised. Except, oops, there's 13 things we could conceptually call routers between us and our server. So to go from the server to our laptop, we do not just go through the router at our house and that's it. No, no. There are, on average, 13 hops between us and any data we're looking at on the internet. And again, I saw some models that suggested it could be 50 hops or like 100 hops. This is crazy. I saw many outrageous stats that would just like turn your hair white, but on average, 13. So we're going to go with that. That's our router. We've got our server. We've got our router. What about our laptop? There it is. That's it. The laptop is really the least of our worries in this system, and that is going to become important later. So file it away in your mind. Our energy hog here is definitely the server and the data center where it lives not our laptop. But so for this client server downloading a song from the internet situation, uh, how much electricity do we use? A whopping 0 0.0328 watt hours to download What's Going On by Marvin Gaye from a server. That is a little more than half of 1% of your cell phone's daily charge, which I cannot depict here because it's just too small. <laughs> but as we did with the last example, what if we applied this model of getting and sending data, the client server model, to the entire internet? Look at, because keep in mind, 90% of today's internet does use this model. So this is our actual burn rate. I told you that you didn't want to actually see that. I was not lying. And this number, 14.6 terabytes, is the amount of data that we transferred, all of us collectively, humanity, via the internet every second of every day in 2017. And as other talks have, I think, done a really good job of illustrating, this is like a wild estimate. I got this, you know, I can definitely send you the sources for, the, for these numbers, but you know, it could have been double that. Doubtful that it was half of that. Either way, it's bound to be way more in 2019 than it was in 2017. But 2017 was the most recent number I could get. So, yeah.
That amounts to over 3 million megawatt hours, but like every second, which is confusing to think about. Don't worry. Again, it's just a number that should represent lots and lots of electricity to you. And in fact, it's possible that it was way higher. These are, this is one stat that I found for the amount of electricity the internet used in 2017. So again, it's possible that my assumptions in this model were way too uh, conservative, but wanted to err on the side of caution here. So there must be some reason we're using a client-server model, right? Because energy efficiency is not it. So why are we using this model? The most appealing aspect of using a client-server architectural model for a website or an app is centralized control. What is so great about centralized control? Well, the fact that one entity can control the servers for an app or a website makes it fairly straightforward to scale, maintain, update, or push updates out, and back up said website or app. Basically, if you control all the machines that the code and the data live on, and I'm using the word control kind of loosely here because a lot of this happens you know, in the cloud, not on, on, a prem on premises on a machine. But if you control those machines, it's easy enough for you to decide what to do with them. And this is a very appealing thing for most people making technology these days. But centralized control also has significant drawbacks. It renders the system rather brittle because there is a single point of failure here. And I'm exaggerating because, as we all know, data is duplicated around the world in data centers and server farms these days. But what I mean by a single point of failure is not necessarily the servers, but the company that controls those servers. So when you have a single company owning the infrastructure for a lot of the web, the people running that company, the decisions they make, the attacks they suffer can have outsized effects. And the number of companies running the internet, as we actually saw in Anne's talk earlier, is pretty small. And this is, again, 2017 numbers, and it actually might even be, I think Amazon actually has more than 50% of the internet infrastructure, or the web infrastructure at this point. And that's like super alarming. You know, whatever decisions they make, say to, you know, use wind power or not, it has a huge effect on the overall footprint of the web. Um, but it's not just about the energy that they're using, it's also just about corporate control. So, you know, Amazon could decide to cut off services to this or that or the other place, and there's not really a lot that people can do about it because and they're a private company and they can do what they want. As an example, they recently forced the encrypted messaging app Signal to stop a practice that made its services available to activists in countries like Egypt and Qatar. And there's just nothing anyone can do about that. Those people you know, were organizing against autocratic regimes and one of their major technical tools just kind of went away. So uh, it's not good for it, having a centralized uh, internet is not good for a lot of reasons, um, I think. We can all agree. So a peer-to-peer -peer model actually addresses these issues pretty head-on by just not having centralized control. <laughs> it's kind of a fundamental philosophical difference here. Since every device in this network acts as both the client and the server, taking one node out of this web doesn't actually change the system that much. In the example of this diagram in front of us, the two cell phones might have to wait a little longer for some data, but they'll still get it. And we can even have corporate control of some of these nodes. That's okay. Um, because the resources are distributed around the system to, device, to devices controlled by lots of different types of entities, companies, private citizens, et cetera, it makes the system much more resilient overall. So, <clears throat> Decentralized control is one of the main pros to a peer-to-peer -peer model, and it directly counters some of client servers' main drawbacks. So decentralized control makes the system more resilient, and it actually makes it no more difficult to scale or back up than a client server model. That said, oh, actually, 
it's also cheaper. <laughs> key, key factor here. Because a lot of the expense of maintaining the infrastructure of the entire system falls to sort of individual users in that system, it's a lot cheaper to run. Um, right, so that said, there uh, are some drawbacks to decentralized control, which are that it's a little less straightforward to maintain and update, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that it hasn't been the most popular model for so long. So my guess is that you know there are a lot of really smart people working on these problems right now, and I'm guessing that uh, these won't remain true cons for long, but you know, that's a prediction we can all just live to find out. Okay, so the real question remains, is we see that peer-to-peer -peer has a lot of pros that address the cons of client-server, but is it more energy efficient? Okay, let's find out. Here's our system again. We're going to download this Marvin Gaye song, the themes of which I think have endured even over the course of this long talk. can make a joke here about pentagrams and pictures with Marvin Gaye. Okay, so in a peer-to-peer -peer context, we have no server. So that giant source of energy consumption is just gone. Our laptop itself is doing most of the work. And we know from earlier that that isn't such an intensive thing. There's our tiny little blue square of energy. Except with a peer-to-peer -peer network, there's an overhead cost that isn't present in the client-server model. And that's that for each device to keep track of other peers in the network, what content they have, how far away they are, et cetera, they have to be in frequent communication with each other, which comes with energy costs, twice the energy costs, in fact. So with client-server, once initially routed, it's clear where your request should go and the path it should follow. There's like a pretty static map at work there. But in a peer-to-peer -peer network, the map needs to be constantly updated. So yes, we aren't incurring the cooling costs of maintaining a data center, but we are incurring some additional costs here. And the rest of the nodes, our devices, are acting primarily as routers in this setup. So they are, of course, also consuming resources on their own but it's not primarily because of what we're doing, right? In addition to helping us get a copy of what's going on by Marvin Gaye, they might be checking email or downloading an MP3 of their own or like streaming a video or something. So we're not gonna count their baseline energy consumption because that doesn't actually have anything to do with us. We're just gonna count the routing expenditure, which we can see here is pretty small. Except my diagram only shows four additional routers and there are actually on average something like 15. So that's more, right? <laughs> 15 is definitely more than four. Uh, so a little bit heavier than initially meets the eye. And since these nodes are just like our laptop, they are also incurring the same update the map all the time costs that I described before. So yes, it's still double. Upsetting, to be sure, but this is it. This is the sum total energy expenditure of our system. And if you're still awake, you might be thinking, hey, that seems like less overall than our client server model, but is it really? Let's add it up. A whopping 0 .006 watt hours to download what's going on by Marvin Gaye from your friendly neighborhood peers. That is a little more than a tenth of 1% of your cell phone's daily charge, which I again cannot depict here because it's even smaller <laughs> than the last one that I didn't want to depict. <laughs> So as with the other models, we're going to take this one and say, what if we applied it to all of the internet? What if we could wave a magic wand and convert the entire internet to a peer-to-peer -peer model? Of course, in 2017, because we're living in the past. So here's our burn rate. Here's our 14.6 terabytes of internet traffic, er, data transfer every second of 2017. And that amounts to 531,852 megawatt hours. But again, per second, which is super confusing. But that's compared to the 3 million megawatt hour figure that we got for the client server model. So we'd be burning about less than 20% of the electricity if we converted all internet traffic to peer to peer. That seems kind of like pretty good, right? Here's our review. I mean, you know, we weren't talking about an MP3 in the non-distributed peer-to-peer example, so that's kind of apples to oranges. But 
these are the numbers. Seems like a slam dunk, right? We did it! Just convert everything to peer-to-peer, -peer, save a bunch on the energy, march off into the glorious future. No problem. Well, as you can imagine, it's a little bit more complicated than how I've described it so far. Yes, folks, there are disclaimers, <laughs> as with anything in this world. <laughs> okay, so first off, as I noted before, we didn't count the baseline energy consumption for routers, but those they were still on, right? So that's still overall energy being used by the, by the entire system of the internet. Uh, it's just that it would be very hard to calculate which percentage of it was being allotted directly to our task. So it canceled out, we didn't count it, but in the client-server model, we had 13 routers, if you recall, and in the peer-to-peer -peer model, we counted 15. It's possible those numbers are like way out of whack, right? You can easily envision a scenario where the routing cost of peer-to-peer -peer is so great that it overtakes the cooling cost of client-server when there are like just too many hops. We'll get back to that again uh, in a second. But um, the other disclaimer is downloading an MP3 is a pretty light task, computation-wise. There's like not a lot of processing involved in doing that. And there are many emerging technologies that distribute computation as well as data, a sort of peer-to-peer -peer computational model. So we're going to have to wait and see what that ends up doing to the overall impact of the you know, electricity that the internet is burning. Um, but it, it's just something to sort of keep in your mind. That my, the example I used was you know, extremely simple. However, this is a pretty good time to acknowledge something that many of you may have been thinking about throughout this talk so far, which is <laughs> the ecological blight that is Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin is peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So you've been told. And it is using up all of the electricity on planet Earth. So you have also been told. So is it the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of Bitcoin that makes it so energy intensive? Thankfully, no. Um, yes, everyone owns a piece of the ledger that keeps track of who transferred Bitcoin to whom, but that follows the same model we just analyzed with the same energy overhead. So why is it then that Bitcoin uses so much electricity? Well, because in order to find or mine new Bitcoin, one must do a bunch of random arithmetic. That's like how the system was set up. You do random arithmetic over and over and over again, and it's like, entering, it's like buying a lottery ticket into discovering more Bitcoin. So that arithmetic is not like one plus one style arithmetic. It's way more complex than that and therefore requires way more computing power. And in fact, the more Bitcoin that is mined, the more computing, po computing power it takes to keep finding it, which of course uses ever more electricity. Mining Bitcoin, I feel like, can kind of be seen as like a way to convert electricity directly into wealth. Like the wealth one accrues is directly proportional to the amount of electricity one burns, which I think we can all agree is like not what we're looking for if we're trying to conserve energy, which we are. Um, but the problem of Bitcoin and my little sort of like uh, sidebar on that here leads to my third disclaimer, which is unintended consequences. There are undoubtedly going to be unintended consequences of widespread adoption of peer-to-peer -peer architecture it will enable things we haven't considered, and those things may end up being very energy intensive. But even with these disclaimers, I don't think we should call client-server versus peer-to-peer -peer a complete wash with regard to energy efficiency. To go back to my numbers here, the potential savings is just too great to ignore just like on a system architecture level, especially considering that there are strategies the builders of peer-to-peer -peer apps can employ to address some of our known knowns here. So what are those? I'm going to take them from most technical to least technical here. Um, route efficiently. This has actually come up in other talks today because it does apply to client server to a degree, although it just has a bigger impact in a peer-to-peer -peer system. So creating efficient routes for a protocol is a pretty high-level ask uh, because it, apply, it applies to the design of the protocol themselves. And I'm guessing most of you are probably not currently engaged in designing a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. I am not, <laughs> for instance. Um, but maybe you are the person choosing the tech to build your app on. And if you are, I recommend adding efficient routing to your list of things to consider when evaluating the various protocols that you could use. Um, minimize network requests in the first place. So this is 
going to sound a lot like the other advice you get on a, you know, for a normal sort of client server model like website or app. And that makes sense. The laws of physics still apply here, right? So conserving energy is still conserving energy. Um, minimizing network, you can minimize network requests by caching assets locally, only requesting or delivering the assets as they are needed, only use the maximum size that is needed. Oops. Um, but there's an additional sort of category of strategy here that applies specifically to peer-to-peer, -peer, and I find it to be the most sort of inspirational aspect of this, um, of this topic. And, and that is that instead of trying to go out and find a green host, for instance, to host your website, you get to think of yourself as the web host. You get to make the choices about your home and office that will drive a more sustainable internet overall. Like, and this is very in keeping with the underlying philosophical view of peer-to-peer -peer networking, which is that each person in the network has no more or less power than any other person, and each person's decisions affect the network as a whole. It's a very democratic, utopian idea, and it's a big part of why this model is getting traction at this moment, I think. Um, so it also turns out to be more energy efficient. So isn't it nice? when life works out like that. <laughs> okay, so that's it for me. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, or if you would like a list of references, I did not include them in the talk, and there are many, many of them, um, holler at me in the Slack, or email me, or tweet at me, or, you know, just like internet me. Thank you for